Hello? Hi. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> okay, I've just got it up. all this on my small computer and it's kind of working. Okay. <laughs> that's good. So how are things going in your uh, land of signal processing? Well, I've discovered some math equations I wish I'd knew, known last year. And, uh, and I'm, I've, I'm considering that um, calling it, I'm taking two courses because I'm doing the signal processing and then I'm doing um, an essay about uh, um, optical coherency elastography. So again, I'm thinking about the active matter because I'm in that section of it at the moment. I could just maybe do a brief presentation on it. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the paper you had, um, but it could be uh, from my other course. Like I, I did do some work on it. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Since since you've mentioned it a couple of times, but anyway, so I'll I'll get it together before um, telling you. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so other than that, um, it's going to be um, warm today, relatively warm. Yeah. You know your Celsius temperatures oh, yeah. very well? Yeah. It's 25, going to be 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, yeah. <laughs> in October. <laughs> in October, yeah. <laughs> and so um, are you doing Hacktober? Yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's yeah, it's a take on actually on Oktoberfest. So <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well I haven't gotten into programming anything and I haven't finished my um, deep learning course and for machine learning. Yeah. Which I have to do, but one course at a time. I'll do the signal processing and then I'll I'll worry about the other things I was going to do, so. Because yeah. <laughs> I have I have to do the the stuff for my thesis, or a uh, professor is going to go ballistic again. <laughs> <laughs> he gets really upset sometimes. I'm going, what did I do? Oh, not enough work. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. that would be it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's good. Uh, I don't know who else is joining us today, but why don't we uh, just start and then people can join in as they come through. Um, so, yeah, let, let's see. I have a number of things to talk about today. Uh, this is, uh, you'll, you'll see that this is October 4th, and you'll see what the significance of that is in a bit. Um, okay. And then we have some other things to review here, some papers and, and some other things. So let me share my screen. So this last week, uh, let's see. I'll, um, I'll turn off my screen. Can you see my screen at all or? Yes, I can. I, I have, a, have had a very slow internet. So I'll just turn off my, okay. my picture. And maybe my voice. So it, I'll right. just do that All right. because, yeah. So this is a couple of things that we had this last uh, week or two. Uh, so the first thing was is our uh, annual meeting was on uh, this last Tuesday or Monday. I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. And so uh, we talked about all updates from all the different groups in OpenWorm. And we talked about DivaWorm. And I... Last week I showed the uh, paper from, or I showed our presentation, what I was going to present to the group. It was a review of our papers and presentations and events and, and activities from this past year. And so everyone was pretty impressed. And we had, you know, this is the meeting where they have all the board of uh, directors and all the other people who um, were kind of behind the scenes to make open worm work. And uh, we also had the other group leaders uh, we call the senior contributors, who are the people who are, who have done a significant 
set of contributions. We have like 16 senior contributors. And some of those people, a lot of those people run projects. And so we had some updates on the projects. It's actually some pretty interesting advances in OpenORM over the past year. Um, the cybernetic uh, project, for example, released a new version where they're able to, so they do this thing where they have a, like a finite element model of the worm. They, they have a physical model of the worm where they take the worm and they break it into pieces. And then they use those pieces to, they put them into a, 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 a multi-physics model where they have like the physics of the surface that the worm is moving against. And so they can calculate all of the physics as this process of movement is going on. So, um, excuse me, are they using console? No, they're using their own software. They've built a platform oh. for this. So this is very specific to the worm. Um, but yeah, they, I, I don't think they use console. Um, but uh, they're able to, and this new method that they've worked out, they're able to increase the speed of the simulation. So you can imagine that, you know, you're simulating the worm crawling through its along its surface, you're getting these hydrodynamic forces because they're crawling through, uh, like a, in, in a plate, they're crawling through, you know, a, a medium. Uh, they're also, you know, in the, under the underground, they're crawling through, you know, dirt, but they're also crawling through, you know, mud and things like that because it's, that's the kind of environment they live in. So they're moving through that and, and that's, you know, they're able to model that pretty well. And this method that they've worked out, it decreases the amount of runtime that's needed for the simulation. So the cybernetic simulation is one of the most computationally challenging simulations in the in the suite of simulations that we have. And so they've been able to cut the size of that down enough so that you know it's it's a better run it has a faster runtime and a better you know, it allows people to run it on their machines. We have the, in the Docker package that OpenWorm has, that's one of the components of it. And, you know, we were running into problems with it. Uh, when it generates images, generating too much information uh, for some people's computers. So that was a bottleneck that was kind of solved this year. Uh, we have some interesting work going on with a lot of work with like data processing and, um, secondary data and and things like and data science so, you know we have uh, for you know we, we have people working on different formatting uh projects we have people working on uh you know taking data from different sources and, and using it in analysis uh putting it into a simulation uh um format so one of the projects it was a google summer code project in another one of the projects where they took some data from a lab, you know, where they just generated the data hot off the presses and they put it into the simulation. So they were able to plug all that in. So there's a lot of a lot of a lot of good stuff going on. And one of the programs, and I don't think that they've uh, really fully announced this yet, but um, one of the things they want to do is they want to take. They want to invite people who have worked with some of the wet labs around the world on C. elegans, where they might have some data that can be, uh, you know, converted into something more friendly to uh, data, you know, like a universal data format or some sort of simulation. So it would be like a training program to teach people who generally are, you know, biologists uh, on, in their everyday lives. Maybe they don't have a lot of experience with data science or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, simulation or programming, and then they give them, you know, they let them do this basic set of operations on data, formatting the data, making it available. And so that's that's something that's, I think, being in the process of being announced. Um, yeah, that, that might be interesting for even someone like myself who hasn't worked that much with, with data. Yeah. Um, and also, I I am really interested in the programming that they used, and because I might like to use something like that myself. And Open Foam comes to mind, like the Open Package Open Foam. Right. Um, it was recommended to me, so I just wondered what if they were using anything like that, or if they 
from did from scratch programming. Uh, for which one? The... For the simulation. Oh no, I don't think I think they're using a lot of their own material, a lot of their own they stuff are. there. Yeah. Oh, okay, no, I uh, well, see, I might be interested in, my, in yeah, it. Yeah. But, oh well. Open foam, yeah. I, I've never, I've not heard. Is that like an open initiative for like, uh, like materials? Yeah, simulation. it's an open initiative for um, simulating fluids, for instance, but it can also be used for viscoelasticity. That's why I was looking into it. But it's um, a um, oh, what is it? a Linux-based um, program. So it's sort of command line, I believe. <laughs> Anyways, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm very curious to know what they did use. Uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of it is like their own, their own code, and uh, so yeah, I don't think they've they've built on top of a lot of platforms for that, um, which is you know both good and bad. You, you get the benefit of the platform, but then you're well, sometimes you're locked into that format for that platform too. So, um, you know, it's, it's both good and bad, but I, yeah, I like the, um, I, I like this idea though of in general, you know, being able to take people from different areas of science and exposing them to other areas. So I think that's, uh, that's one good program. And, you know, I don't know, we, we kind of do that in this group, but we don't have a formal mechanism for like, say someone who wants to do uh, biology and they want to learn some computation. Uh, I've had some people actually, a actually ask me, you know, if we could, uh, you know, do something in a C. elegans wet lab. And I don't have access to that, but I mean, like the idea that you could at least learn kind of what that looks like or some of the skills involved in that might be something. I don't know if it can be done virtually, but um, I mean, certainly like familiarizing people with the you know, how things were, I mean, you know, it's a lot of it's technique, but a lot of it's also like the sort of unveiling what's behind the curtain. Because I think a lot of people don't know much about like what goes on in a lab, you know, what the protocols look like, what you're looking, you know, for, um, you know, like if you want to understand some problem, how do you go about doing it? Uh, how do you yeah, go about well, answering I'm quite interested in the wet lab too. Because, well, I have salamanders and so on, so I'm interested in what goes on with worms yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, so it would be like, you know, people, you can set up like a worm culture. There's a whole sort of literature on worm culture. We've been doing this for 50, over 50 years now, and so as a model organism. So people have worked out a lot of techniques. It's a very open area, so there are a lot of shared protocols. Uh, so, you know, you, you basically get some worms. They have stocks that you can order from not only the wild type, but the mutants. And then you put, you know, you get some, uh, uh, you get some Petri dishes, you put some media down on the bottom, some gel, and then you put some food, which is usually this bacterial mix. And you put the, just, you know, you get a, what they call a worm pick. You pick them out, uh, you put them in the new, uh, petri dish and you incubate them at usually at room temperature that's all that's required and then they grow and you can do a lot of things with them <laughs> you can harvest the eggs you can look at the adults under a microscope you can do different assays of in uh, larval development where you can uh, arrest their development or you can um, you know do do all sorts of different experiments um, so it's, it's a very flexible organism. It's very relatively easy. The uh, life history is like about three or four days, but sometimes a little bit longer, but your generation time is really short. Like, you know, maybe two days, you can get a new generation. So that's why people use it for like aging research for uh, different types of uh, metabolic disorders, things like that. So, and, and you know, the methods are, it's kind of hard because the methods, you, you know, a lot of that you just have to like do by hand. It's like a lot of the wet lab training that I had, for example, wasn't a classroom, you just 
did it by observing other people and then doing it <laughs> and that's it but there's got to be a better way sometimes and, and there's got to be a, a different way to do that that's what i'm saying no is there um would it benefit from being visually able to see right through the cells um while it's developing what do you mean like? it, well my optical coherence elastography as um or tomography will see right through a worm like it'll see all all of the tissue from top to bottom okay because it's small enough yeah it's it's x-ray using uh infrared light so i just wondered if the research would benefit from something like that or or not yeah i'm, I'm not sure that people have used that method on it um, it would definitely, I think it would be workable because, um, you know, there isn't a lot of, uh, it, it's a, a fairly transparent organism in that sense. Like you can see, you know, through the skin or through the yeah. epidermis uh, as you're working with it. So like a lot of the microscopy, light microscopy, you can see the cells, and, you know, but uh, yeah, I think that would be great. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if people have used that before. Maybe they have, and I'm not aware of it, but that would be an interesting thing to look up, C. elegans, and then... Because C. elegans, you know, is a pretty uh, basic workhorse of biology, so people may have used it and just to do a test of the uh, technology or whatever, but it might exist, and it'd be interesting to see what kind of images it comes up with. Yeah, especially the elastography, if you could kind of get a look at... Um well, the elasticity of the cells as they progress, that might be interesting if you could get it to work. Yeah. Anyways, just yeah. just thinking of thinking. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah, that would be great to see if that, and yeah, I guess it's the elegans. As organisms go that you can culture in the lab, it's actually one of the easier ones. So. Yeah. That was frustrating salamanders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're a bit frustrating. Yeah. Picky. You put two, two salamanders together and they go, eh, we don't like each other. <laughs> no eggs, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, anyways. So, the, one of the other things I wanted to mention from the meeting was this whole brain emulation article. So, the, like, this is the, the 10th anniversary of Open Worm. And, uh, They've been doing it for 10 years, and it's changed a lot since 2011. But this is an area that kind of open worm has kind of interacted with for a while. And this is uh, whole brain emulation. So uh, this is from Less Wrong, which they do a lot of topics like this. No progress on C. elegans after 10 years. And so this is whole brain emulation. It's a proposed technique which involves transferring the information contained within a brain onto a computing substrate. The brain can then be simulated, creating machine intelligence. This is discussed in the context of scanning the brain of a person known as mind uploading. And then they have a definition here for mind uploading, which is uh, pretty obvious given what I told you. So this is uh, this whole area, you know, the idea of C. elegans is that you have this relatively small connectome, 302 cells, and it's tractable enough so that you could understand the entire connectome. It's not, it wouldn't be impossible. So the idea was, you know, if you have 302 cells with a uh, tractable number of connections, could we just simply simulate that entire nervous system and uh, download it onto a computer? Which, you know, this is one thing that uh, OpenWorm has done is, is to take the connectome data and uh, plug it in with um, Electrophysi simulations of electrophysiology of ion channels and look at how those uh, circuits work. You know, the um, different cells in a circuit, how they work, how they produce behavior. And so that's been something that we've had. Now, their argument was is that, you know, they want to actually download the C. elegans brain and simulate it, which I don't exactly know what that means, especially in the context of C. elegans where we can simulate, you know, basic movements. We can simulate it in a, you know, a, a 
uh, biophysical context, we can simulate some of the basic movements. We know some of the, what some of the circuits do, what they generate. So, I, I mean, you know, there's that part, but then there's also this idea of like the entire brain being this autonomous thing. And I, I don't know, maybe this is a, a bad question for C. elegans because um, we don't really know what, I mean, beyond that, we don't really know what is involved in a C. elegans brain. It's just that, you know, it's generating movement and, you know, it can behave, it can behave adaptively. And, you know, that's that's maybe all we can ask for because we, we couldn't get the experience of a worm, say. Uh, you know, uh, worms, the C. elegans, as, as for example, nociceptors. Can those nociceptors detect pain? And if that's true, then do C. elegans actually feel pain? Or, you know, these sorts of questions. I don't know if we can answer those. It might be something interesting to look into um, but I don't know what that would look like. Um, you know, we don't have a project on an open room. So, um, so then this just kind of goes through this 10 year, uh, quest. This is Steve Larson who runs, um, open worm. He's one of the main people in open worm. And he was one of the original people who would do a lot of, you know, outreach to groups like this to have discussions about this sort of topic. He's an AI guy. So, um, he's interested in some of these questions. So he had this message here. I like less wrong because it links to everything, gives you like a preview. So that, you know, he kind of uh, chatted to these people about uh, C. elegans and uh, C. elegans simulations and some of the references here. So that's, that's from 10 years ago. Um, so Openworm at that time focused on the anatomical data from dead worms, but very little data exists on living animal cells, which is not true now because we have uh, real-time measurement techniques that, um, you know, when they say dead dead worms, they mean like um, cryosectioned images where you know they can get really high-resolution images of the worm, but it's fixed; it's it's a static view. With other, you know, there might be you know there are other imaging techniques that we can use with, you know, as the worm is behaving, as the worm is still alive, and try to get to some of these anatomical uh, components and model them. So, you know, this is something that we don't really have a lot of an open worm. I mean, you know, we're adding in things all the time, but maybe not at the rate we would like. Um, and so uh, they kind of get into the Confidence of a complete functional simulation of the C. elegans nervous system. So this is someone in the chat group here. They said that they had uh, confidence, 76% confidence that it would be achieved by 2014 and 99.8% confidence that it would be achieved by 2020. And so that wasn't obviously, wasn't uh, fulfilled here as they're making the point. Um, so, you know, I don't know, first of all, what they mean by uh, whole brain simulation in the context of C. elegans. I guess if you can simulate a connectome, you know, that's that's probably pretty good. Um, if you can simulate movement or other behaviors, that's even better. I don't really know uh, beyond that what you can say about it. I mean, you can say if you're a human and your brain was uploaded into a machine, you could evaluate that. And you know, because you know what you know and you know what you feel and you can verify that. But I don't know what it means to be like to upload the brain of an organism. Um, what, what's what's the like the minimal representation there? I don't really know. But um, in any case, um, now there are a lot of things we don't take into account when we build the model. Of course, we don't take into account a lot of the molecular detail, for example. So cells have a lot of molecular uh, mechanisms going on in them that modulate some of the ion channel activity that you know in response to stimuli so we're not simulating any of that we're just simulating the ion channel activity which is you know is fine if you um you don't have to simulate the molecular uh level because you can just simply modulate it by kind of making guesses or simulating kind of what you think the regulation looks like you don't need an, a lower level there on the other hand we don't know that for sure we don't know that like adaptive changes might require things that are sort of built in that we don't really understand yet. And so, so that, that, that's the problem with, you know, a lot of the 
you know, we're trying to simulate organisms. And the question, there are two questions here, I think. One is that you have, uh, you know, this sort of idea of representation. <clears throat> like, what level of representation do we want? Do we want to have, like, something that's very, absolutely complete in every way, in every detail, even if we don't understand how it works? Or do we want to, like, simulate the parts that we know work and then figure out maybe how things are regulated, how adaptive change happens, and then maybe we can fill in the gaps from, say, like, you don't need a molecular level, you just need to understand what the molecular level does, which we don't really know, but, you know, that would be enough. Um, and then the other question is, is like, how do we know the entirety of like C. elegans behavior? What is it doing? You know, we know it's moving, we can observe that. We, you know, we don't know if it's thinking about anything. Uh, we know that it feels that there are no susceptors, but we don't know what their pain sensation translates into in the world, other than like, you know, uh, changes in movement and in, in direction of movement. And so the same holds true for chemosensation as well. They experience a chemosensory gradient. They move towards it or against it or whatever. It's just a signal. And so, we, but we don't know beyond that what, what the brain is actually doing. Uh, sometimes, you know, signals are integrated in, in uh, interneurons, in polymodal interneurons, but we don't know, you know, what that, if there's anything more than just a simple integration function. So I, you know, I don't know, the whole brain thing, it's, it's interesting, but I'm not sure that that's really the, the true scientific value of what you can do with, you know, creating digital organisms or creating digital uh, C. elegans or whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't know if that's really the value of it, but in any case, they, they had this, they, this is like a 10 year reflection on this. And I think it's interesting, but I don't know um, if, I don't know if this phrase up here, no progress on C. elegans after 10 years is necessarily accurate in the sense of what we, you know, maybe the goals of what we want to know. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, so it was a good meeting. Uh, I've used up a lot of time here, so I don't want to <laughs> spend any more time on that. I did want to get to why October 4th is important, or at least to me, or at least if you're interested in regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. So, um, about, well, this goes back a ways, but about nine years, it's nine years ago now, this week, I think, um, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for 2012 was uh, announced. And we had uh, two people win this award in 2012, John Gurdon and uh, Shinya Yamanaka. And the way they do Nobel Prizes is interesting. They usually take like uh, two or three people and they try to find a body of work that's really significant and then they share the prize. So like <clears throat> John Gurdon was a developmental, he is a developmental biologist and he's done a lot of work with frogs and other types of embryos. And he discovered that you can do this sort of what they call indirect reprogramming, where you can take a, a like a germ cell of one organism and you can take the embryo or the uh, nucleus of another organism and you can put that nucleus into the germ cell and you can produce another and you can produce basically a clone. So, you know, they've done this with sheep. I don't know if you've heard of Dolly the sheep. Um, you know, that's basically this technique. And so it's uh, called cell somatic nuclear transfer. And so he's, he did a lot of work on that and early work on embryos and regenerative medicine. And so that, that set up a lot of what Yamanaka did which was to take that a couple steps further and take uh, like a skin cell and take transcription factors, which are molecules that are generated, you know, generated by express genes, uh, usually in the form of RNA. And you, what they call transfect a cell, which means you take the RNA and you put it into the cell using some sort of retrovirus. And so you can get, if you can get these transcription factors into the cell, you can get the you can trigger the expression of more of these genes and you can change things in the cell. So you can change the expression of the cell's genetic program. What's interesting about his work is that he identified, they screened a bunch of genes for this and it came down to four or five genes. And this, in the prize here, it's, it's a four gene cocktail. So it's 
Oct4, SOX2, CMIC, and I can't remember the other one now. You know, I had this like stamped onto my forehead at one time, but it's uh, <laughs> been a while. So, um, so this is these are these four factors, and they basically you know this is the circuit that controls pluripotency. So if you upregulate those four genes, um, you get this change in in the state of the cell. So these two were awarded the prize together. So the, uh, the prize was for the discovery that mature cells can be reprogrammed to become pluripotent. That was the name of this prize. It just seems like, you know, if you go back and you look at the Nobel Prizes, like the names are like the, the award is like, it's this really complicated thing. You know, it's not like I discovered uh, penicillin. Well, maybe penicillin, but actually that's not what they give the prize for. It's like things that relate to the discovery of penicillin. It's, it's quite something. Oh, hi, Jesse. How are you? In any case, this is this is the 2012 Nobel Prize. This is the announcement here. Um, and so they kind of go through. Uh, yeah, so they talk about the frogs. Uh, John Gurdon, he was able to do this uh, cell somatic nuclear transfer in frogs. Um, and uh, then so people were skeptical about this. This was in 1962, and it wasn't until 1996 where they did this in sheep, and that was Dolly the sheep, and that was where it was really kind of uh, taken mainstream, I guess. Um, Rodin's research taught us that the nucleus of a mature specialized cell can be returned to an immature pluripotent state, but his experiment involved the removal of a cell nuclei with pipettes followed by their introduction into other cells. Would it ever be possible to turn an intact cell back into a pluripotent stem cell? And so this is where we get into Yamanaka's story. And this was much later. This was in the aughts about, I think, the uh, his the paper on the four factors was 2007. And so they did this paper, and it's been, you know, ever since people have just been working on reprogramming. They've actually been able to reprogram. The four four factor cocktail works to create stem cells or things that look like stem cells, I should say, because they're not really true stem cells. There's a lot of variability there. They call them IPS cells, which are induced pluripotent cells. But they've also been able to make uh, neurons, different types of neurons, using a similar technique where you have, in this case, I think three to five transcription factors that you can put into a uh, maybe like a skin cell. And turn it into a neuron. So you know you, you put these factors into the cell, into a population of uh, skin cells, and those skin cells will then start to sprout axons, and they'll start to find their neighbors. And maybe so if you're lucky, they'll form maybe a connection or two. They're not like you know you don't get a full blown nervous system out of this method necessarily, but you do get neurons that are somewhat functional. So that's really interesting work. Um, so this is the main uh, transcription factor involved in reprogramming to a induced stem cell fate, and this is OCT4. And this is why we're here today, because we want to know more about what the day is named after. What It, it has no connection. I'm just, it's an octamer binding transcription factor. And f 4 is just like the, um, you know, the sort of the number 1, 2, 3, 4. So um, it's also known as POW5F1. That's not a date, so we can't have fun with that. Is a protein that human in that in humans is encoded by the POW five F one gene. Opt four is a homeodomain transcription factor of the POW family. It is critically involved in the self renewal of undifferentiated embryonic stem cells. And so this is actually an, uh, this is an embryonic stem cell colony, as you can see here. You can see the sort of how they form this colony of stem cells, and then they're surrounded here by uh, skin cells or fibroblasts, and this is what they look like when they're reprogrammed. You get a, a cell that transforms and then it starts, as a stem cell, it starts to divide and form this colony. And then you can pick these colonies out and pass it them to new uh, plates where you can, like, you know, you keep feeding them on, on feeder um, fibroblasts, which is a layer that you can use to keep them alive. And you can keep these uh, colonies alive for quite a while. So, the, and stem cells, unlike, uh, say, like uh, fibroblasts, uh, are known for their ability to self-renew. 
So fibroblasts will maybe can maybe uh, make about 20 divisions before they start to die off, and they, they have this uh, programmed cell death that they undergo. It's, it's what they call the Hake flick limit, which is where you get a certain number of divisions before the cell line terminates, it just kind of becomes blobby and the cells become non-functional. With stem cells, even in embryonic stem cells, you don't see that. They can divide infinite for an infinite length of time uh, and never the line never goes extinct. It just keeps going. That being said, these stem cell colonies are pretty uh, uh, fragile, so you have to really work to keep them going. But um, that's not due to the Hayflick limit. That's due to like the um, the limitation, the uh, metabolic limitations of the environment. So this is, you know, this is how we can really make some, you know, we can make some biological changes. Maybe they say um, you can really you know, see these things. So you have OCT4, SOX2, uh, they work together. Those two genes usually work together. You can, they, you know, there are different ways you can do this reprogramming. Uh, there was a paper early on that was like at the same time as the Yamanaka paper where they did five genes. Uh, the two OCT4 and SOX2 are really the ones that drive this process. Although there are other genes that kind of support it. And so this is, you know, this speaks to the nature of a genetic network. That you have the, all these genes working together, co-regulating each other. Oh, okay, Nanog is the other one, I'm sorry. Um, you have all these genes working together and um, they're regulating the cell, cellular state, the stem cell state. And the question is, is which ones are the most critical? And so these uh, Nanog, CMIC, SOX2, and OCT4 in this case are the most, uh, they have the mo the largest effect on the phenotype. So this is uh, this is why, um, and this is you know the Nobel Prize. They just announced the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for 2021 today. And so maybe next week I'll tell you about that a little bit more about that. That's also another interesting one that has a lot of neuroscience uh, significance. So um, how are you, Jesse? If we're just listening in. Okay, so, um, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say. Um, I have been looking at the metacognition paper, but I may not really have time to submit really anything to that. Uh, I'm looking at some of those submissions that we mentioned in the group, but there's not a whole lot of major updates today. Okay. Well, that's fine. Thanks for attending. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, let me see if my... Screen share is working better. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are abstract submissions. So this is something that uh, we've been working on for this uh, Neuromatch conference. And so I think I mentioned the Neuromatch conference last week. And this, these we're making a list of things that we might submit. So if people have ideas for this, um, this is with my other group as well. And there are a bunch of people who are associated with both groups that are putting their names down here. And I'm just trying to coordinate a bunch of people who want to participate in this and submit abstracts. Are you, are you sharing your screen now? Oh, I don't know if this is working well today. This, okay. Yeah, screen share might be off, but um, in any case, uh, this is, yeah, you can watch it on YouTube after and you'll see the screen. Um, so there's all, you know, we have a number of different uh, topics. So we have things that are following up from the last, um, from the uh, pre, like last year we did. So we did the ANNs, BNN stuff. We did uh, Connectome Networks actually at Networks 2021, but this might be something we can uh, do. I actually did a talk at Embryo Networks uh, at the first NeuroMatch, I believe. So that's, that's something we can also revisit. Uh, there are other topics. I, I don't know how deeply they want to go into developmental biology. It's a neuro conference. So there has to be sort of a neuro, neuro angle to it. But, um, you know, maybe there are some, there's some topics in uh, that have like a developmental biology 
neuro overlap that people might be interested in. This one here, neuromorphogenetic patterns in the theory of deep learning. This is a poster that we did. And so that we can maybe, we, we can turn that into a submission as well. So this is coming up on the 25th. So if you wanna, I have the link, I can actually put it in the chat or put it in the Slack since people are not, not a lot of people are here today, but this is the spreadsheet uh, link. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to apologize for not being able to do any of this. I'm tied up with, with the PhD work. Um, yeah, yeah, it's always tough to <laughs> do stuff when you do that, so it's fine. Um, I just wanted to bring that up. The next thing I want to talk about is Hacktoberfest and our involvement in it. So this is, again, if you can't see the screen share, I'll just kind of mention it, and it'll be online later. Um, so we I set up the repositories for Hacktoberfest. So it started the first. So we get a slow start, usually. But uh, I wanted to promote this a little bit. I promoted it a little bit on Twitter. So let me see if I can find the tweets here. Um, this is... So this is our banner here, Hacktoberfest. It's like uh, two embryo cells. It's like a uh, green and orange uh, theme. So it's, you know, it's the Hacktoberfest logo. And then the, there are two tweets. Uh, one is where it just mentions the different repositories. And then the second one, which mentions a different set of repositories. So, um, the repositories are there's in Diva Worm, there's digital bacillaria, and I put a little badge on each one. So, in the README on each uh, repo, so you can see if you follow along with the digital bacillaria one, you'll see that there's a badge in the README, and that's at the top. And so, if you look for these, uh, these badges, you'll see which ones are open to uh, contribution. So the digital bacillaria, we actually have some people working. So Ojibwa and Azmit Singh who worked on it uh, back in 2019 are, are reviving some of their work with a couple people. I think uh, Tharun and um, I think that's it for now. But uh, they're trying some new algorithms. They're trying to, uh, they have a new data set that they're working with. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. Um, but if people want to contribute in some way to this, they can leave a they can leave a message on one of the issues, or you know some other way to get in touch with the repository. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here from like the last from maybe about two years ago to about a year ago, but we're working on getting some new things in line. There's also the uh, open papers, the Bacillaria psychophysics, which is. Uh, something that's in the process of being submitted out. And um, so that's another thing that we can kind of go over. I, ideally, I'd like to go over some of that maybe in next week's meeting. I didn't really have a lot for today on that, but I'm going to probably cover it next week. So one of the reasons we do Hacktoberfest is because we can then kind of go through and, um, you know, cover some of these things and highlight some of what's going on. The other repo is the group meetings repo, which is uh, actually kind of a meta repo because we're kind of putting things in here that are um, sort of having to do with group meetings and managing those. And we also have a project board. So we have a badge on that readme as well. And we have a project board uh, that has issues. And a lot of those issues are things we mentioned in the meetings. So people are, you know, there are also, I don't know how many issues are on this board, uh, probably about, at this point, about 70 or 80 active ones. So we have, in different states have done, so a lot of them are finished. Some are off the radar, but these are things that people can address or ask questions about. And then Jesse asked about the virtual developmental worlds, which is something that issue 113, and I think I answered him on that. There's a discussion in one of our lab meetings about two weeks ago where I kind of go over um, some, like it's some simulation 
of cells that I found in someone's talk. They they had this uh, they had these slides where they had these simulations, and it was kind of odd because it was like I'd never seen this before in a talk where they actually have the simulations as like background. And I looked it up, and there's this project where they do this, where they're doing and people do this for a number of reasons because it's easy to visualize or it's easy to understand what you can visualize. So, you know, you have these uh, cellular and subcellular processes that they simulate, this company that's doing the simulation. So, uh, I, you know, I, it got me thinking about like, you know, how can we make sort of like development or, you know, things like that into a more of a virtual experience that people can understand some of these processes a bit better. You know, maybe there's simulations we can use or even build in some cases and then use things like, you know, virtual reality headsets or um, polarized glasses or stuff, things like that to sort of sell it and bring it home to people. And so I, I don't know how that uh, project would work, but this is something that I've been kicking around for a while. And I, I've tried to get people to, you know, uh, get involved in like 3D simulations of, of an embryo where you have like, you know, you build like something in Blender, which is a 3D model you build a cell and then you build maybe things inside the cell and you can navigate the entire embryo that way. You know, you build like a sample embryo where you have maybe like a 16 cell embryo and each cell has, you know, has a position and it has an, maybe even an identity. And then you can maybe go into that cell and look at what's going on inside the cell. And that, you know, that's the sort of thing that would be kind of interesting uh, both from just sort of an educational standpoint, but also, you know, you can do other things with it. Like, can I get, get a sense of like the spatial scale or, you know, the spatiality of some of these things. And you look at microscopy images, it's kind of like a two dimensional experience in a lot of ways. And sometimes, you know, people are generating these three dimensional cell tracking <clears throat> data sets where they're able to simulate the, you know, the data as like a bunch of dots or, you know, something like that. But there's, more to it than that. There's a real biology, and that's that's the kind of thing that would be interesting to sort of simulate. It's not an easy thing, though. It would require a lot of skill. There are also, uh, very early on in the project, I uh, was trying to get some people to help, you know, develop this platform. Um, it was like a phys it's a physics platform, um, and uh, CompuCell 3D is the name. And uh, the idea is that you have these, you can build like, you know, entire tissues, organs, and you can build them using, you know, different, uh, you know, you have like independent cells in the simulation, and then you can put them together and you can run it. So you can put it, you can plug in data to these simulations. It's a series of cells. Like if you want to build a virtual liver, you can build a three dimensional liver with all these cells. And then each cell has processes inside of it. And you calibrate it using real data. So you collect data from like wherever, you know, physiological data, developmental data, you plug it into the cells, and then they the simulation runs as if those cells were autonomous agents within like this tissue that you're simulating. So you can simulate things like disease, you can simulate things like, you know, regulatory states like, you know, homeostatic states or, you know, whatever you want to do. And so this would be, it, it's a very hard program to use, as it turns out. Um, so that's a problem, but I think the output would be great. And, you know, this is the kind of thing, it's, just, like, it's never been put together in any meaningful way. So I don't know how to go forward on that. Um, but that, you know, this is a thing, like I, I, I want to, like for Hacktoberfest and throughout the year, I want to make this easy to contribute. I want people to be able to contribute code, but also like, you know, how would we do something? Um, you know, what's the road, what's the number, the set of stages we need to get there? Or, you know, even just some project like, you know, getting data and turning it into, you know, turning it into a different format. That would be acceptable. So let me try to share my screen again. It's just not happening today, but we can get through this. Um, so that's Hacktoberfest. The other uh, set of repositories is actually on Devo Learn. So the Devo Learn platform, of course, is perennially uh, 
you know, being developed, we're at 0 0.3.0, and we're probably going to release a new version soon. So there's the DevilLearn. This is the DevilLearn software. All right. And then we have the DevilLearn organization, which has another repository, which has a badge on it, uh, which is this, uh, the data science demos. And I know a lot of people who are regulars of this group have contributed to this. These are like uh, Jupyter notebooks, Colab notebooks, different tutorials for different topics in data science. So that's as usual, always open. That's something people can contribute to. There's a badge there. Uh, we have a nice collection now, but it's like, you know, I'd like to expand that as much as possible. So that's, if you want to contribute to Oktoberfest, there you go. Those are, and throughout the month, we'll be going through some of these things that kind of, um, you know, maybe say more about like what, you know, and I want this to be like something, a starting point, not necessarily just like, uh, you know, we're going to do this this month and then that's it. November 1st, forget about it. I want people to, uh, you know, be able to use this as, as a, tool for, you know, developing projects. So that's Oktoberfest. Um, okay, so I think we're at the point where we get into papers and I don't want to do too much today because we don't have our screen visible. So it makes this zebrafish embryo thing kind of uh, hard to, <laughs> hard for people to see, but like, I'll just go through this and if You'll see, actually, why don't I just give a link to this window or this uh, folder and you can maybe follow along with some of the files, opening them up and, and so forth. So let me uh, do this, Put that, that's the drive. And so starting off here, uh, okay, so this is a light sheet image of an embryonic zebrafish heart. And this is uh, accredited to this person on Twitter here, Sanchez Posada. She's a scientist. Uh, I can't remember where she's located, but this is this nice light sheet image. So light sheet microscopy is really nice. It's really high resolution. We've looked into doing this for different organisms. It's um, it's a very nice technique, and a lot of the stuff that a lot of the data we've used for C, uh, C. elegans in in um, a lot of the microscopy data for GSOC was light sheet microscopy. And so this is better than uh, right field microscopy for a number of reasons, but you get these really high resolution images um, that give you some nice, uh, you know, you some nice contrast and capture a lot of detail. It needs to be transparent. Yeah. And the, to do that. Yeah. yeah. So Another thing here is this, uh, uh, the early stages of development in the zebrafish embryo. So this is uh, Andre Kobitsky. And so this is uh, another one where I, I have the still life image up now, um, which is just kind of like this blob of cells. But if I open up the GIF or the MP4, I think this will play, okay, you get this uh, you can see that it's like the blob of cells that starts out. It starts out at sort of the top of the zebrafish, and then the cells migrate downward towards the posterior pole. There's like this vegetal pole at the bottom, and then there are these cells that migrate across the surface, and then they're going to uh, form sort of the different parts of the zebrafish. So this is an, an interesting di di uh, diversion from like what we see in C. elegans or even in Drosophila. I think last week we saw a Drosophila embryo where they have this mode of, of development where the, there's a cellularization. So you have this big, uh, you have this bean-shaped embryo and then the contents of that are cellularized. And in the zebrafish, it's a little bit different. You have this uh, concentration of s cells at one pole and then they come out um, all the way around the embryo and then they start to form the zebrafish around. You can see here, you're starting to see the zebrafish differentiate um, from the background cells in this image. So it's starting to fold like this. You have the back, the backbone here, the notochord, and then this is how. So 
I gave you this link in the chat as to these images just to get an appreciation for zebrafish. Uh, yeah. Sorry, zebrafish fish are tallest, embryo and fish. So they're they're different from amphibian and different from mammal and amphibian have a variety of different methods of producing a notochord, etc. Like they're it's interesting. There's a huge variety of, of mechanisms uh, in play in different animals. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. And there are a lot of different ways in which things, there's this, uh, you know, th at one time people thought that like they were, you know, that there was this, well, there is this thing called the phylotypic stage, but that, you know, that a lot of, uh, that there's this idea that uh, development recapitulates phylogeny. And it kind of looks that way when you look superficially at the embryos, but that's probably not true to a large extent because there are a lot of mechanisms that are different across different develop, you know, different organisms in their development. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Dick Gordon gave me a paper about frogs and that just shows the variety. I also have a 1950s paper on amphibians and, and frogs brains uh, get developed differently depending on the species is sort of interesting. It's like they're either sort of like salamanders or or some of them just have, uh, they have a, a layer of cells on top of the neural plate as it develops and some have a partial one. It's, yeah, there's, there's a huge variety of things going on just within frogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a zebrafish. Now I'm going to talk about, what do I want to talk about? Well, I do have a thing in octopus embryos. Why don't we talk about that since we're getting into the diversity of embryos. And this is the folder for that. Put it in the chat. Uh, we start with this uh, tweet. It's on a new octopus preprint. We present octopus uh, cherchier, a promising study organism for neuro and beyond. Big brain, see-through embryos, cool reproductive patterns, and you can rear them in the lab. So this is the picture of the octopus model that they're proposing, this lesser specific striped octopus. You have uh, an emerging laboratory model for the study of octopuses. So octopuses, of course, have a, a pretty complex behavior repertoire, uh, pretty big brains for a cephalopod, and also have an interesting development. So then the next paper in the uh, order in the folder is, uh, I think this is the paper, it's related to it, uh, the Lesser Pacific Striped Octopus, uh, Octopus Churchier, an emerging laboratory model for a study of octopi or octopuses. I guess it's octopuses. But um, uh, so the abstract reads, cephalopods have the potential to become useful experimental models in various fields of science, including neuroscience, physiology, and behavior. Their complex nervous systems, intricate color and texture changing body patterns. So they have these, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, marine organisms have this, they have these uh, chromophores where they can change their color or their hue depending on whether they're in the presence of predators or they're trying to remain uh, hidden from prey that they might capture or you know there are a number of reasons why they would use them but they, it's not something that we do so it's an interesting system um, and uh, octopi also have problem solving abilities so often in uh, aquariums settings uh, octopi will are known to escape their uh, tank and like walk around the aquarium and do like all sorts of mischief which is like kind of mind-blowing if you think about it because it's like well we didn't really <laughs> we haven't really octopus proof the aquarium i think they do that now though not that they they're aware of this um, behavior and so they're very smart and they have a lot of like interesting properties as, as a, 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 a model organism so they have high growth rates and short life cycles in some species. So in this case, like we said with C. elegans, 
that makes it suitable for a laboratory uh, model organism or a laboratory culture setting. So, you know, you're going to be raising them in a laboratory. You need to have like a tank. You need to have uh, different, uh, you know, uh, facilities for this sort of thing. So, so what it makes octopus really interesting here in terms of a model organism. So it's a small octopus. It uh, predict has a predictable reproduction, a short time to maturity, small adult size, and the ability to lay multiple egg clutches. Uh, so this is these are all positive things. Um, here we describe novel methods for culture of the species with an emphasis on enclosure designs, feeding regimes, and breeding management. So this demonstrates the feasibility of multi-generational culture of these organisms. Uh, the bread in the laboratory, they grow from a 3.5 uh, millimeter mantle length at hatching to an adult mantle length of 20 to 30 millimeters in 250 to 300 days. So they could have a 14 to 15% survivorship to over 400 days, which is old age for them in the first and second generations. So you can observe, you know, aging, you can observe develop, you know, embryonic development, early development, and the entire life cycle in about 400 days. So that's, you know, pretty decent uh, for a model organism. Uh, C. elegans, of course, is much shorter, but we don't have the, like, a lot of the features of an octopus, like the brain size and some of the other uh, physiology. So this, you know, they lay multiple clutches of eggs. So you, critically in a lot of, uh, you know, uh, model organisms, you want to be able to reproduce them. You want to be able to uh, produce a breeding colony. And I know in axolotl, that's pretty tough. But here they're saying that it's a much easier system to work with um, in that respect. So, and I guess they're also transparent, they're translucent enough that they can work with them. So that's always a plus as well. Um, um, sorry, I want to put a plug in for axolotl. You just have to know how to work with them. Um, so I've discovered that cold water really helps. So if you're, uh, if they go from room temperature to, um, sort of just above freezing that uh, they get excited. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you put a male and a female in, in some sort of icy water and usually you get results and you have to make sure they're, they're young enough to be foolish. Yeah. <laughs> like teenage ones were better, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, they need to be, um, one to three uh, years old and um, anyway, placed in ice water. And yeah. that usually works actually. Okay. So it's, but it's tricky to know, like there needs, there's a formula for doing this and it's not necessarily apparent, but anyways, yeah, they're not transparent, very opaque. Anyways, these octopus, the octopus sound very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they have, you know, uh, dietary needs, uh, water quality needs, like you have to maintain the water in the tanks, uh, which is, of course, you know, going to affect their health and in captivity. They have a diet. Uh, they have very specific diet needs, high protein and low quality lipid or a high quality lipid diet, low high quality lipid diet. So, uh, self safe containment, their life history attributes. Uh, most cephalopod species are semiparous. They die after one reproductive event. So this is uh, where the females commonly uh, will lay only one clutch of eggs in their lives. Octopus hatchlings can undergo one or two mechanisms of development, indirect and direct development. So small egg species undergo indirect development where they lay large numbers of small eggs that develop into uh, paralarvae before undergoing metamorphosis into achieving the benthic stage conditions which are extremely difficult to replicate in the lab. Large egg species, however, undergo direct development, and hatchlings emerge as fully developed benthic octopi, which also experience high rates of mortality. So you have these two different modes of development in different species of octopus, uh, and so the direct development seems to be more suitable for the lab, although that has disadvantages because the survival rate isn't that high. So 
it's um yeah i mean they consider you know a number of species and they're like i said they're trade-offs in terms of you know what you want to look at versus you know what if you can actually keep a population of them alive uh long enough to do the studies that you want to do so this is an example of an adult octopus here you have this uh, in a they show just kind of a shot across here they show the optic lobes uh, so this is kind of like the eye area here in the front um, and then they show the arms here in the male and the female so there are differences in the arms and um, and and that sort of anatomy in the male and female they possess suckers females possess suckers along the full length of all arms um, whereas the male do not um, male male adult possess a specialized organ at the tip of the third right arm uh, which is a smooth suckerless hook-like appearance and is used to pass spermophores to the female during mating so there are differences in you know male between male and female physiology uh, water chemistry system design so they have a lot of stuff on like how to set up a model organism platform and i mean just from the standpoint of looking at see seeing how this is how this works how do you set up a model organism uh, uh set you know setup this is i think this is informative for you know if you're interested in you know why people might use a certain one model organism over another that might be um important to kind of look over and see what they do in octopi so then the other paper is this paper on uh, cambrian comb jellies so this is quite a different uh i'm on octopus so uh, it's not really octopus, but I wanted to throw this in because I think this is something we've talked about in, with respect to um, ancient, in ancient earth history and some of the forms of development back then. So this is kind of shifting gears now towards uh, Cambrian comb jellies. And so this illuminates the early evolution of nervous and sensory systems in, in tenophores. So let's go down here. Uh, Okay. Oh, so this is, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but if you go into the third paper in that folder, you'll see that they have like a, a phylogeny and they have like a number of different um, tenophores and they have like a, a number of different uh, traits on this tree, like these slashes. And it kind of gives you an idea of like the diversity in this, what they call a clade or a tree, subtree and the traits of that appear or are lost in this clade. So in the, in the evolution of these different organisms that they'll be talking about, they have different uh, additions and losses of traits. Um, so the, the summary is, uh, is the following, I'll read it to you. Uh, tenophores are a group of predatory macroinvertebrates as controversial phylogenetic position has prompted several competing hypotheses regarding the evolution of animal organ systems. Although tenophores date back to at least the Cambrian, they have a poor fossil record due to their gelatinous bodies. So that means that they don't really preserve well because they don't have hard parts that preserve in the fossil record. But you still get like things like imprints and other things that they can uh, detect, like, you know, even the Burgess Shale, which is a ancient uh, assemblage that, you know, they have things that are imprinted into this, uh, basically this rock. They got imprinted at some point, and these these organisms are all like, you know, had soft tissues, uh, but they are all preserved pretty well. So we can actually say something. So there are ways that soft tissue organisms can get preserved in the fossil record, but it's pretty rare actually. Uh, here we describe two tenophore species from the Cambrian of Utah which illuminate the early evolution of nervous and sensory features in the phylum. Uh, and phylum is another word for clade, as I mentioned. Uh, here's another elegans, uh, Thalassostephalos elegans, has 16 comb rows, an oral skirt, and an apical organ with polar fields. This other uh, Keener habdotus, uh, Campylinoformis, I think, has 24 comb rows, an oral skirt, apical organ enclosed by a capsule, and a neurological and neurological tissues preserved as carbonaceous films. These are concentrated around the apical organ and ciliated furrows, which connect to a nerve ring via longitudinal axons. 
And then this other species here, this third species deviates from the neuroanatomy of living tenophores and demonstrates a substantial complexity in the nervous system of Cambrian tenophores. So what they're basically showing is that there are all these organisms that are related and they all are, have soft tissues. They're preserved in this fossil assemblage and they differ significantly from their, rel their distant relatives in the present, but they have uh, different attributes across the different species that they're looking at in the assemblage. So it's, it's, you know, basically they're able to show the diversity of life, some of how these early uh, nervous systems sort of evolved and how they differ from what's alive today. So, uh, so most of these competing phylogenies, then they talk about in tenophores, there's a lot of ambiguity as to how things are related, necessitate a complex pattern of convergent evolution of animal tissues and organ systems. Uh, for example, the placement of tenophores as the sister group of all other metazoans, which are animals, raises the possibility that the muscle and nervous systems of tenophores and other complex animals have evolved independently. So this is interesting. This is what they're saying is that the nervous systems and muscle found in this uh, order of metazoans, or this group of metazoans, is different than other animals, which include us or, or um, you know, other mammals or fishes or any other, you know, even like insects. And so that's interesting. Um, living tenophores possess a suite of unique morphological features that makes comparisons with extant members of other animal phyla difficult. These include a biradial body symmetry, which is like two halves. Uh, and actually, it's a radial, it's two radii. Um, you know, their, or, their bodies are organized along a radial organization, but it's like two halves of that. Eight locomotive comrows a sensory apical organ and a pair of tentacles with adhesive coloblasts. So this is the basic body plan. And then they have a number of different other, uh, you know, things in common. So they share features with uh, bioeterians, including a functional through gut with two anal pores and a mesoderm-like muscle structure. Um, so they have different, they, they have, they're related to different types of marine invertebrate. They have different traits that you find in marine invertebrates. And um, so the, the point here too is that these tenophores are sparsely represented in the fossil record. You don't really find too many of them. They're restricted to Cambrian Burgess shale type deposits, which I mentioned previously, uh, with a single record in the Ordovician, which is a little bit later on, and two species in the Devonian. Uh, although alternative interpretations of the Devonian have been proposed, um, Cambrian tenophores possess character combinations distinguishing them from any living species. So we saw in that um, in that clade at the beginning where you had those dashes across the tree, those slashes were um, different tra character traits that either appear or disappear in, in the phylogeny. And so what they're saying here is that there's a unique mix of these kind of traits in these organisms that they've, they've seen. And so this is interesting because you know, far back in life, you know, you have this, uh, you have this clade of tenophores, you have this smaller clade, which they're examining in the assemblage, and they look quite different than the modern version, although there's similarities as well. So um, I think I'll stop here for today. I think that's enough. Uh, I was kind of hoping for some nice pictures, but they didn't have anything that I saw in there. But in any case, I hope that uh, maybe next week we can hear um, I don't know if, what, what Susan's schedule was on that talk that she mentioned, but um, in any case, I, we'll have, uh, we'll probably continue with our, uh, Hacktoberfest next week, and we'll talk more about some other things. Uh, yeah, if I could just do maybe a, sorry, a five-slide presentation or something, that, that would be all right, then give people a, sort of a, intro to it yeah yeah i think that would be perfect five slides and then we can just talk about talk about it and that would be good yeah and then i would have done that and and um added it to what i'm doing for the other fellow and enough <laughs> then i will have then i need to concentrate on the other parts yeah. of what i'm doing here well I, you know i hope it yeah i hope it's something that's helpful to your broader research agenda i don't want to like, uh, yeah, well, it's a part of it. 
yeah, yeah. Sure. And it's a small part, but um, it's important to point out that uh, tissue is different when it's dead than when it's alive. And why? Well, it's active matter when it's alive. So it's, it's important to point out that point. And yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for attending, and uh, if you have anything, let me know on uh, Slack or email or whatever, and um, see everyone next week. Bye. Okay.